Good morning. Morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry. And this is the morning light daily Bible study. We're going to be in Hattiesburg, Mississippi this weekend at New Hope New Life Center with Pastors Marcus and Joy Champ. So that's going to be exciting. We've been back there a few times. So if you're in that part of the country, you'd like to participate, look up New Hope New Life Center on Facebook, look at the page, and you'll get the details for the meeting. I'm going to try to do a uh, post on our site and something on social media and via email about that as well. Today, we are studying in John... Chapter 4, Part 2, verses 27 through 54. The aftermath of a power encounter. Mm -hmm. It doesn't always, whenever something dramatic happens and God moves, it doesn't always have the effect that one might anticipate. In John 4, part 2, the disciples come upon Jesus talking with the woman at the well, and they're amazed that he's going to have anything to do with her. The people of the city come out at her word, and this woman's word, and they meet Jesus, and they believe. However, they believe, but they are dismissive of the woman's testimony because they hold her in ill repute. Uh, others hear of Jesus' exploits, and they come to get a miracle, but Jesus reproves them, calling them unbelieving sign seekers, nonetheless healing their sick. The aftermath of a miracle is often a mixture of scandal, shock, unbelief, and confusion. If you're ever going to be used by God, to reach your family, friends, or your community, you got to make up your mind not to be scandalized or wounded if things don't work out afterwards mm -hmm. as you might hope. So, Kitty, if you'd begin by reading John chapter 4, verses 27 through the end of the chapter, please. Verse 27, and it came, uh, I'm sorry, and upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman, yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city, and said to the men, Come and see a man which told me all things that I ever did is not this the Christ. Then they went out to the city and came unto him. In the meanwhile his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that you know not of. Therefore said the disciples, one to another, hath any man brought him aught to eat? Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, and look unto the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages, and gathereth fruit uh, unto eternal life, that he may he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. And herein is that saying true, one soweth and another reapeth. I sent you to reap that whereupon you bestowed no labor, other men labored, and you are entered into their labors. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified, He told me all things that I ever I did. So when the Samaritans were come unto him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Now after two days he departed thence and went to Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet hath not honor in his own country. Russ says, Just because it says that, he testified that a prophet hath not honor in his own country, doesn't mean it has to be that way. Some people read that and they say, I found my calling. <laughs> Not to dishonor your prophet. 
It doesn't have to be that way. Verse 45. Then when he was come to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they also went unto the feast. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee, where he made the water wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When Jesus, when he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. And the nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus said unto him, Go thy way, thy son liveth. And the man believed. Y'all get on up out of here. Your boys are living. <laughs> Yay. And the man believed, and the word that the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Of course he did. Then inquired he of them the hour he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew that it was at the same hour in which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth, and himself believed, and his whole house. Now he believes. <laughs> this is, again, the second miracle that Jesus did when he was come out of Judea into Galilee. So, in part two of our study of John 4, Jesus' disciples return from an errand and find Jesus speaking with the woman at the well in Samaria. They are absolutely astounded that he's having a conversation with this person. Why? Because she's the wrong person in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now, while they're shocked, however, Jesus being with them for some time now, and they became accustomed to his different way of doing things, they hold their peace. Now, let me ask you, when is the last time? Can I ask you a question? Thank you. <laughs> when is the last time that you had a conversation with someone that would scandalize your friends if they found you so doing? You'll notice that in talking to the woman, they said they found Jesus conversing, talking to her. He wasn't trying to get over on her. He was simply having a conversation as though he, Jesus, expected her to be interested in the things that interested him. When you are in public or speaking to strangers or unbelievers, you don't have to adopt this affectation of spirituality or religious overtones. You don't have to lower your voice in the restaurant because you may be talking about things that might seem out of place or better discussed inside the church walls or among <laughs> the initiated. Come on. Remember, I can't tell you how many times mm -hmm. I've gone into a restaurant just having a conversation with people at the table and the Spirit of God came down and I took authority over everything and everybody mm -hmm. under that roof. Yes, Not because I was being narcissistic or obnoxious or drawing attention to myself. The Spirit of God began to move. One time we were witnessing to, it was, a customer and his wife can he wanted us to go we did a service call he wanted us to go out to dinner with him and we've told this story yep. before it was a computer store Russ was yeah when we were in business mm -hmm. and uh, in the midst of the conversation he calls up a friend who's dying of cancer and asked me to pray oh, that's right. and so I didn't raise my voice I didn't adopt put it uh, you know a some sort of uh, affectation. I just took the phone. It's in a loud restaurant. I couldn't whisper. We were in the middle of the room. I didn't take a, oh, yes, oh, yes, brother, cupping my hand over the receiver. Right. I didn't do that. I talked to this guy just like I was going to tell him where he could go down and get a fishing license in Warsaw, Missouri. And I prayed for him. And the Spirit of God fell. And everybody in that restaurant put their utensils on their tables and their hands in their laps and bowed their head and the Spirit of God fell in that place. Supernatural, I tell you. And when we were done, we just went right back to enjoying our meal and our conversation. You don't have to adopt this affectation of spirituality or the, you don't have to lower your voice. Uh, remember, if you are the only one doing the talking, 
it isn't a conversation it's a sales pitch <laughs> that's good let me say that again if you're the only one doing the talking at the table it isn't a conversation like jesus was having if you look at this conversation she did most of the talking and then jesus was just responding if you are doing all the talking it isn't a conversation it's a sales pitch too often those who evangelize seem to be selling the gospel like amway or some other multi-level marketing scheme and people know when they're being gamed they absolutely know do you know when you're being gamed i know when i'm being gamed for they ever open their mouth i know they're going to try and sell me some dinar mm -hmm. i know they're going to try and sign me up to amway they're going to try and get me uh, to sell Shackley, uh, Malaluka, something. They're after me, and I'm just waiting. I'm waiting for the, for the, the other f shoe to drop, and you just you have a sense of that. No, just talk to people. Have a conversation with them. Share a meal. Buy somebody a cup of coffee. Jesus crossed lines and showed interest in this woman in a way that demonstrated to her that he thought she was valuable. Kitty has a statement. She says, no one's disposable and everybody counts. Mm -hmm. Now, notice what happened next. It said the woman seeing the disciples, it said then, in other words, you look at the verse, it says when the disciples showed up, then the woman left. After what? After the disciples showed up. Sitting with Jesus, I don't think she had anywhere else to be. She felt included and she felt accepted. When the disciples joined the scene, she couldn't get away fast enough. Do sinners feel comfortable around you? Do they feel loved? Jesus didn't accept people because he didn't require change. Because almost every interaction he had with a sinner, he said, now go and sin no more. He got in their Kool-Aid. He got in their business. Don't be doing that no more. So it wasn't like everybody's all rosy. I'm okay. You're okay. You're wonderful and I'm wonderful. And it doesn't matter how we live our life. Let's just salt a little condiment of Jesus on a, a plate of our life and everything will be rosy. That is not what Jesus did. But yet they felt love around Jesus. What about us? Do they move away because they sense this us versus them paradigm coming off of us like our mouthwash isn't making it? Jesus, he didn't accept the woman's sin, but he looked past her sinful behavior and her condition and he ministered to her. He was dealing with her according to her need and not according to her problem. He was speaking to her felt need what, what was her felt need? She came with a bucket for water. She came with a bucket for water. He said, uh, I got some water. I got, I got your water for you right here. Mm -hmm. She came for water, and on that common ground, Jesus enlarged and connected with the deeper cry of her heart. You don't have to be a theologian. You don't have to be profound. You just have to have enough. One scripture says, some having compassion, making a difference. Amen. Just show them compassion on the people around you. Look them in the eye and show them that you think they're worth getting to know. I can't tell you how many times we've done that in a marketplace <laughs> context. I remember little Carrie at the convenience store where we got our gas in Branson. Mm -hmm. And she was there and, and uh, a couple years. times and eventually we start asking her name and she's so humorous. She says it's Carrie like the movie. Um, just just not scary. Just not scary. <laughs> <laughs> and she became our buddy. Uh -huh. We'd stop in yes. uh, to see her for Thanksgiving. We'd stop in to bring her something for Christmas. We got to know Carrie. Yeah. And Carrie connected with the ministry. And she connected mm -hmm. her friends with the ministry. What did she do? She was saying, come see a man. Hey, man, I'm, I know some Praise preachers, God. and they don't act like other preachers. And Praise she God. met some folks that were people of faith that she actually wanted her friends to know something about. I'll guarantee you, if we tried to am away her, mm -hmm. she wasn't going to be running home and telling her friends, "Oh, I need to, you know, I need to introduce you to somebody." No, because she did, wouldn't want to be gamed, and she didn't want to be responsible for seeing her family getting gamed. Now, 
The disciples, they ask Jesus, they implore him to eat because they know he's famished after a long day on the road. He declines the food they've brought him, even though he originally sent them after it in the first place. Why? Because he's had meat to eat that they know not of. His meat is to do the will of him that sent him and to finish his work. When you minister at this level, it doesn't deplete you. If you are doing the work of the kingdom and it leaves you exhausted and diminished, maybe you need to rethink some things. Are you listening? I personally, when I'm exhausted, my, just between me and God, I think the, to that part of me that is spent and exhausted, that's the part of me that was operating in the flesh. And the part of me that was excited, that's the part of me that was under the anointing. I always Amen. work Amen. in the ministry that I do. I always try to find that place. When I feel the the expenditure of my natural energy, I try to back off mm -hmm. and find that place where I'm partaking of the meat rest. that Jesus That's laboring to enter into about. his rest, and you have to learn that. It's practicing it. Labor to enter the rest of God. That's why ministers are very insular. They keep the people at arm's length. Why? Because they're spent. They've, they're expending energy. They're expending energies that they, they want to preserve their stamina. But you have to understand that part of us, ladies and gentlemen, that gets spent, that part of us that we want to preserve, we want to protect, we want to segregate from the people because of the demand we feel that depletes us. It's because we, it's, it, it's the metric, our exhaustion, and Jesus' restfulness after a long day is the metric of the difference between how he ministered and the resources he ministered from and the resources we ministered Let from. me just share another quick example. Yesterday, we, we learned a couple years ago that once in a while they'll get us a massage. So yesterday I had a separate massage from Russ because of their time schedule. And um, the young girl who helped me was a precious believer. She's a Catholic uh, member, but she believes in God, the Father, Son, Jesus, He, Holy Ghost, the whole host of heaven. And But she said, well, what do you do? And I started talking to her. Now I'm getting a massage, right? That's the time when you get your muscles to be relaxed. I am so stoked on the inside. She said to me, now how can I, how can I begin to know that I'm hearing God's voice? And I had the most awesome, awesome time. I don't even tell, I can't tell you what my massage felt like because my spirit was alive and jumping with answering every question came out of her mouth. And in one hour, my session was over. I know I was refreshed, but I was more stoked in the spirit because this little girl, a mother of two, single, she got to hear from heaven yesterday. It's so refreshing. In that same setting, one of the other ladies was asking uh, Kitty questions. Kitty passes me. I had to go sit in this lady's chair, and Kitty passes me. She says, you need to prophesy to that lady. That lady, she's ready for prophecy. You need to prophesy to her. Because he was going in for a facial next. And uh, <laughs> so sure enough, I got in there, and what Kitty had planted, I got to water. Hallelujah. And, I, and she started asking. I knew, I knew when they start asking questions, you know, you're getting through. She started asking questions. I talked to her about how the scripture says God gives you the desire of your heart. And I explained how that, that means not only that God gives you what you are desiring, he causes you to desire the very thing he wants to give you. He put it in there. And she got quiet a minute and she came back. She says, does that mean, and does that mean, and is this how that applies? <laughs> and she got real quiet and she started receiving. So Kitty planted something. I got to water. That was a whole bunch of fun. So Jesus is saying that's what his meat is. See, the meat, which, oh, that's, that's, that's the meat of the word, is it? One of my mentors said the meat is in the street. Mm. It's not some false idea of a deep teaching. See, are you listening to I like me? that. It's what you do that will feed your soul, not what you think. What you think or what you study at the deeper life weekly 
Deeper Life Club weekly gathering, that's not, that's not the meat of the word. That will feed your mind. It will feed your spirit. But there's something more that we're missing. See, it's, I, I think too many Christians are on a high-carb diet. They don't have enough spiritual protein. How do you get the spiritual protein of God's word? By putting it into practice in your life. So Jesus then makes a comment about the timing of his conversation with the woman at the well. How many times have you seen a need or a possible opportunity to share your faith and you thought, well, this isn't the time to do that? He says, don't say it's four months then the harvest. So it's, oh yeah, here I'm at the well, the disciples are gone, there's a woman there. Well, this isn't the time for me to minister to her. Why? Because he's there by himself. And Lord knows, that's the 11th commandment. Thou shalt not minister to someone of the opposite sex if you're by yourself. So what's he going to do? Let her go to hell? Mm -hmm. I remember a, a lady, she was a Texas debutante and a beauty queen and a prophet. And uh, I was just a kid. I was in my teens and she, she ministered frequently in my parents' church. And she talked about how she was flying all over the country and uh, how often she would wind up sitting by some single guy, and she was happily married, and this guy inevitably is going to hit on her. And uh, she would, you know, usually, as a good woman would do, she'd just rebuff that, ignore it, put him in their place, shut him down. And then God told her one time, he, he said, Marcia, you are a prey unto men, P-R-E-Y. And... Uh, she said, what do you mean, Lord? And God began to deal with her and show her how to take that unwanted attention and turn it into a gospel opportunity. Amen. And she got that she would leave many of those people just being moved upon by the, by the Spirit of God. But how many times? You know, it's like we're at work. Well, this isn't the time or place. Or we're at the gas pump. Or we're at a restaurant. Yes, or, or the, and you'll feel it. You start talking about God, we do that. I'll start feeling the people around us bristle. Mm -hmm. They're not moving. They're mm -hmm. not looking back at us. But you sense that they're just bristling. They're mad. You've had all they're kinds irritated. of reactions. We, went to a, we were at a gate where our flight was delayed. And this gate was packed. There was not a seat left. And up walks Warren Hunter and Kayla Hunter. And in Atlanta, we, they were going one way, we're going the next. They were good friends of ours. And we just sat down, and we didn't talk any differently. We just talked to each other the way we would if we were sitting in his office or had been back home in Branson in my office. And we talked about the things of God. And Warren is going to preach. He's going to preach the gospel. He's, He's a preaching breathing. machine. He's preaching. And, boy, you felt just the ripples, the bristling go across that crowd. <laughs> Man, it was like the, the herd of swine. They were looking for a steep hill to go down. <laughs> and we just kept right on going. Amen. Amen. We, weren't, we, weren't, we weren't having this triangulated conversation where I'm saying something to you, but it's really intended for the person no. that was listening. No. No, that isn't what we did. We were just being ourselves Amen. around them. Because that's the first thing. These guys were saying, they saw Jesus talking to this woman and they were thinking, man, this ain't the time to be doing that. And he says, don't say four months and then the harvest. Come on. See, Jesus understood this in human nature. He said, the harvest is ready and the laborers are few. Take advantage of the opportunities in front of you and don't look for reasons to go on your way. Why? He incentivizes them by saying in verse 36, because there are wages connected with it. When you gather fruit unto life eternal, there are wages for sowing seed and there are wages for reaping the harvest. Now, maybe you won't get to reap that person into the kingdom, but you will still be rewarded. Jesus says you are, you are rewarded the same for planting the seed as you are for reaping the harvest. So don't feel like you're a failure if you're not leading the person in the sinner's prayer. Maybe you won't get to reap that person in the kingdom, but you're still going to be rewarded for sowing the seed or watering the seed. Paul understood that. He picked that up and taught on it later. One plants, another waters, another gets the harvest. Mm -hmm. Even if they receive the word on stony ground or thorny ground, even if they receive it and the birds of the air come and take it, you get rewarded as if they took a hook 
line and sinker, <laughs> and ran to the altar to get baptized. Are you listening? You'll get a reward. You'll get the same reward as though you reaped the full corn in the ear and actually brought them to a new birth experience. Don't be discouraged. People get discouraged if they fail to close the deal. You know, if you've ever worked in sales, you know something about a closer. Where when you're spending big money, you got somebody who gets your interest, you got somebody who keeps your interest, you got somebody who makes the pitch, and then they have the closer. They bring in the heavy hitters. And that's the person who closes the deal. You may not be a heavy hitter when it comes to evangelism, but you're still important. Whenever I, I put together a national sales organization and a medical management company, and I had a team, I had, all, I had like 16 teams, and one of them, we called them telepartners, and they were the people that were fielding um, inquiries about our services and connecting them and setting appointments for our guys to go out. And guess what? That telepartner shared the commissions that the salesman would be paid, even though that telepartner never even met that person. Are you listening to me? Mm -hmm. Jesus is telling you that evangelism is on a commission basis. That's what he's saying. And you're going to get paid a commission if you are faithful to that which you're called to do. See, if you are successfully leading someone to Christ, then don't take so much credit for yourself as the uh, verse 28 says, you're not doing it by, for yourself. You are entering into other men's labors. So the rock star, and the one, it doesn't get all the, the, the credit. Right. <laughs> you aren't the only influence in that person's life. <laughs> you can be sure that the Lord has been working in that person's life for a while and just positioned you at the right time to reap them into the kingdom. Think about the Ethiopian eunuch, the most the iconic evangelistic encounter. Philip meets the Ethiopian eunuch. Mm -hmm. But the Ethiopian eunuch was up in his chariot reading the scroll of Isaiah. I wonder where he got the scroll of Isaiah. He got it from a planter. And he was being watered. Mm -hmm. And Philip comes along and he got the increase. Guess what? Everybody got rewarded. So because of Jesus patience and solicitude toward this woman at the well. People in the city believed on Jesus, even though they were Samaritans and he was a Jew. In the 1950s and in the Azusa Street Revival, they said the gospel crossed the color line. <laughs> Ethnicity, religious background are overcome. But you notice where they do balk. Now here's where you get these mixed results. They balked at the testimony of the woman said, well, we don't believe this because of you. We believe this because we heard him ourselves. In other words, they didn't want to give her credit. Maybe she was taking the credit. It's possible that she was taking the credit to herself. This lady had a strong personality. She had five husbands, and the one she was with was not her husband. Mm -hmm. This was an out-of-the-box person. And I guarantee you she had a strong personality. She, no doubt, might have gotten offended at this. We'll believe maybe she didn't. Now, we've seen this many times in our life. God uses you, does a great thing in somebody's life, but they don't give you credit for your part in it. Kitty and I have seen lives changed. We've seen people transformed. And guess what? We've also seen the people go on their way as though nothing happened. Don't expect people to say thank you. One of my pastors told me one time, Hold everything loosely. It's all about the Father. Hold it loosely. See, their spirit may have been born again, but many times their sense of self-referral is intact. And they aren't just aren't going to have the character or the civility to show their appreciation. Just because they changed their mind about Jesus doesn't mean they're going to change their mind about you. I really had, when we started ministering at this level and we started reaching tens of thousands of people and seeing dramatic things happen, that was an adjustment. It took me a couple of years mm -hmm. to get past that. Don't get offended. Just keep on seeking the kingdom. You did not do it to be thanked or to be seen of men. You are seeking the kingdom, and you'll be rewarded for your part in ministering to people's lives. Then we see Jesus. He continues on toward Galilee with the expectation that though he's been heralded as the Christ of God, 
among the Samaritans, he says he headed for Galilee because he said uh, that a prophet's not without honor, right. except among his own kin. In other words, the Samaritans that everybody hated said, this is the Christ of God. And he says, okay, got to go. That's how many times, I remember we, we left uh, the Springfield, Missouri the first time many years ago. And at that time, God, we initially in Springfield, Missouri, we were deeply rejected and come against and warred against. And then things changed and people were coming to our house and leaving with tears on their face, leaving literally, a tra I remember one time I said, Kitty, come here. And I showed her a trail of tears going away from our door. Mm -hmm. They came to be ministered to. They were generous in their giving. They left with tears of gratitude on their face. I said, now it's time for us to get out of here. Mm -hmm. So you th we think, oh no, it's time to build our, mm -mm. it's time to build our family life center. It's time to build, it's to get in a building program. No, that's the way man thinks. That's right. In the Didache, one of the early church documents that's known to have been circulated, they said something. They said, when an apostle comes one day, receive him. If he stays two days, receive him. If he stays the third day, reject him. He's a false apostle. In other words, you got to know that sometimes it's time to move against everything. Oh, they receive me here. They think I'm, I'm doing a good job. They accept me. I like that. I like it too. But there's a point where it just reaches saturation. You're going to know it in your spirit like here at a stick break. It's time to pack your bags. And if you don't do it, you're going to regret it. That's that's when we left Branson the last time. God said, I've got something else for you to do. Keep your headquarters here and go on to Arizona. So, Jesus comes again to Cana. And there are many people who now believe on him. But why do they believe? Because of the miracles that they heard he did in Jerusalem. They are sign seekers. Make no mistake about it. When they believe because of what they see, they will not believe when you don't show them something. Mm -hmm. These are the people that come sit in our meetings. They sit down, they cross, they spread their knees out their chair, they cross their arms and they say, go ahead and impress me, I dare you. They're sign seekers. The Jews seek a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom. And they go away wounded if you don't do it. They, they go away wounded in their rebellion and their victimization, incapable of being corrected. I can't believe he didn't prophesy to me. Listen, don't put your hopes in men when you're called into this thing. People are fickle. They will sing your praises one day and get bored and move on the next. They will crucify you if you bore them. I'll never forget, Kitty and I, when we started out in ministry, uh, God gave us tremendous favor in Clinton, Missouri. We had people, they were getting up singing odes. They were writing poems about Russ and Kitty. They were saying Russ and Kitty more than they were saying Jesus. Come on now. And they jumped out there and they went and got a place to have a meeting. They got pulpit and pews and they said, you're going to be our pastor now. And say, that's not what God told us to do just like they tried to make Jesus king. And here they were, they couldn't get enough of Russ and Kitty. And because we wouldn't take their pulpit, because we wouldn't be what they wanted us to be, within a matter of just a few weeks, it was crucify them, crucify them. And you wouldn't believe the ugliness that came out of those exact same people. And they would come on the backside in hushed, reverent tones, Rubbing their, just putting their hand on our shoulder, rubbing our shoulder like they're comforting us. No, this is our ministry. This is what we're called to do. <laughs> Listen, you are not called to run a Holy Ghost dog and pony show. Just keep seeking the king kingdom. Just keep doing what you see the Father do. Keep your eyes on the path before you and don't look back. Don't look back to see how many people are following you. You might be disappointed and turn back yourself. Mm -hmm. Stay faithful to God. Because Jesus knows what's in these people. A man comes to him asking for his son to be healed. And Jesus looks at the man. He says, you're not going to believe unless you see a son. He's, he's dealing. He goes right for the jugular. Many times people come to us as prophets for a word from God. And guess what they do? 
They treat us like psychics. They hold back information, yeah. hoping that we will discern it by word of knowledge so it doesn't require any faith for them to believe what we say next. Come on. If I give you a word of knowledge, it's because you need unbelief to be dealt with. I don't have any unbelief. I believe God. I just want to see if you're for real. Oh, really? Well, the Bible says plainly that when you give a word of knowledge and a prophecy, 1 Corinthians 14 says it's for the unbeliever who hasn't accepted Jesus yet. And here I've heard prophecy teachers that are household names in the prophetic. They're the iconic prophets of our generation, and they insist that a pro prophecy that doesn't contain a word of knowledge is not a valid prophecy. That is absolutely wrong. They are sign seekers. Sign seekers will say, Hosanna, Hosanna one minute, and crucify him, crucify him the next. Jesus is not being unkind. He's just establishing the fact that in spite of the man is suffering and the need at hand, he, Jesus sees through it all and he attempts to bring the people to a point of maturity, which they all conveniently ignore because they're not disposed to deal with it themselves. They're mm -hmm. sign seekers. That's right. They aren't interested in maturity. They're interested in what happens next, what miracle Jesus will do to titillate their sense, knowledge, faith. And God says, it's time to grow up past this. Are you breathing? We're breathing. We didn't even have to have snorkel gear today. Ask me how I had to learn these lessons. Mm -hmm. Jesus just looks at the man. He says, okay, get on up out of here. Your boy's alive. The man leaves, and he's met by servants on the way. Upon the inquiry, finds out the boy was healed, and then he minutely examines him. Now, when did he get healed? When Jesus said, and it said, then the man believed. He must have been second cousin to Thomas. <laughs> I believe it when I could put my finger in the wounds. Jesus shows up, says, be not faithless, but believing. Amen. When you, have to, when you won't accept a prophetic word unless it contains a word of knowledge, you're doing the same thing that Thomas did. And God says, you're faithless. That's faithlessness. Come on now. Be not faithless, but believing. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If you, have to, if you will only commit to the word of God that doesn't make a demand on your faith, <laughs> that doesn't please God. That's not a transaction that pleases God. It's certainly good that the man believed, but it would have been better if he had believed not having seen. Many times people get miracles now, here's what happens. If this guy was around today, you know what he'd do? He'd have, within about six months to a year, he'd have a book on the top 10 Christian bestsellers list. <laughs> I met Jesus, and my boy was miraculously healed. We had a notable miracle, a miracle so notable that it made it in the annals. You think, you think about it. If, you got, if you've had a miracle in your life, you think they'll be talking about it 2,000 years ago? Whatever happened with this guy, it was so notable that two millennia later, we're still talking about it. Are you listening? Many times people get miracles and we want to know more about them because we think there's some key element they came upon that triggered their miracle. If this man had written a book about his experience... He might have sold a lot of books, but it wouldn't have helped anybody. The boy was healed in spite of his sign-seeking attitude. Just because somebody gets a miracle does not make them an authority. They can go on the speaking circuit. They can go on sin raw. But we better be listening to God and believing the testimony of his word before somebody else's idea of what must be done in order to receive from God your deliverance. Men and women have built ministry empires on testimonies and experiences of which their understanding was very, very flawed. We have to go to the word of God and let the testimony of Jesus be our first line of reference before anybody else's idea of authentic spiritual experience. E.W. Kenyon is the father, or the he, he was the quell, he was the... Uh, source material for the Word of Faith movement that has so uh, impacted the body of Christ. Uh, you can see his thinking. He's gone to heaven now. You can see his influence in Kenneth Hagin. You can see his influence in 
Kenneth Copeland and everybody else that they've influenced. You go back and read the writings of E.W. Kenyon. And one of the things Kenyon talked about constantly was sense, knowledge, faith. He was very concerned about the signs and wonders movement because it was galvanizing people according to something that they were seeing in the natural. And he said that everything, all zeal, all reaction, everything that comes up out of that which can be seen and heard is sense, knowledge, faith, as opposed to that that believes, even though it hasn't seen. And it's a balance. It's a balance that needs to be struck because I think the prevailing religious system we call Christianity today has the same character of the prevailing religious system in Jesus' day, the one that crucified him, except he's not coming back to be crucified this time. Sense, knowledge, faith. The religious crowd always wants to see something before they will commit. I've, heard, I've seen people, Brother Walden, when the move of God comes, I'll be there. When the move of God comes, I'm going to give sacrificially. When the move of God comes, I'm going to connect. I'm going to lay my life down. Thank you very much. Not needed. Mm -hmm. No thank you. Because the person that responds to that kind of dog and pony show is the same person that will just wipe it, wash his hands and head off somewhere else for the next Holy Ghost circus that comes along. Mm -hmm. God wants us to have, he doesn't want us to be pursuers of the action. He wants us to be originators of the action, the things of God, the moves of God, the miracles of God. He said, these signs shall you do and more. He said, you'll be do greater works than these. He didn't say you will observe greater works than these. We're not called to be observers. We're called to be originators of that, that other people are sitting around waiting to happen. We met, we've met many people who could pull up a word of knowledge but they weren't submitted to the master, not Jesus. They were submitted to somebody else. And so their life became a wreck, shipwreck, because their character had not been rooted and grounded in the word of God. Someone we know had a pure and perfect word of knowledge more than once, and he's sitting in prison today for 28 years. So you have to know that the gift of God is without repentance, and even the people on the psychic network, remember that years ago? Somebody said if they were so authentic, how come not one of them saw it coming when they went bankrupt and went off the air? Not one of them. So you have to know the source of the gift and know that it's God's. When it's submitted to God, it will produce life and that more abundantly. So you want to be careful what you hear and how you hear. Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you that you are the true and living God and that you have life-giving resources to bring to us every single day and that should we fail to go to the secret place we won't hear your sweet secrets but we do go there and we long to go there and we want you to interrupt our day and carry us to the secret place father in agreement with you so that you can talk to us about what you'd like accomplished for that day and this day and we thank you for it in jesus christ's name amen